Okay, everyone, for my name of Omar Nada, I'm a data scientist at OBC, and I have been again, in, not in this position, but as a facilitator for a commander system paper um, three months ago, and when I found decided to say a couple of minutes ahead only, uh, a couple of days ahead. Anyhow, for today, we're going to be talking about the deep neural network for YouTube recommendations, how YouTube recommendations work, and what do they look at, uh, how's their structure. And this is done by Paul Covington and Jay Adams, I mean, uh, Fergin, who are like, I know Jay Adams is huge in deep learning and the commander system at Google. Um, thanks a lot for Serena and Preston, who I bugged so many times the last week. Okay, so to start with, just basically what we're gonna do, be doing is we're gonna cover some common definitions and namings in the commander system uh, domain. And then we're going to talk about why is the YouTube recommendation specifically is challenging. Um, we're going to talk about the structure, the algorithm, how did they do it. And then we're going to talk about the results, how basically uh, they, the, the recommended system performed. And lastly, we're going to be talking about discussion. And there's going to be an open floor for anyone to um, basically bring up any point. So, YouTube recommendations. So this is usually the, the thing we see on YouTube if we use our phones, right? So the first thing is implicit rating. So one, when you're dealing with a recommender system, there's two kind of ratings, implicit and explicit rating system, right? So implicit is, okay, actually I'm gonna start with explicit. Explicit is something that you actually, the user, evaluates the system itself. So something on Amazon is by saying four star on YouTube, but the like or dislike button is an interaction directly from the user with the system. That's the explicit rating system. The implicit is basically, I don't have enough expli uh, explicit rating, so I try to use the data behind the user and the item interaction to come up with the rating system that makes more sense. So for example, the watch time history or how long, how many times did you watch the video, etc. So these are the implicit and explicit ratings. Precision uh, in the recommended system field is gonna come a lot. It's, it's the basic of metrics of how you evaluate recommended system. So precision is how relevant is the item being recommended to the user. So if you watch a lot of football videos, I can't come and show, I don't know, um, ballet, for example, unless you're really into it. Um, so that's provision of how relevant is the item to the user. Recall is how confident am I, um, if the recommend, if the recommender system giving you uh, an item and you are gonna either purchase it or watch it. So there's difference between relevancy and then recall is how confident is the user gonna watch that specific video. So these are the common definitions, and we're gonna, if there's anything that comes up, please ask. Um, so how does the model work? So we have a two stages mo a system that basically gives out the recommendation at the end, and they focus specifically on what comes next. So they don't give you 10 videos, they try to make sure that the video that is next is the one that you're gonna be watching. So how many people do, do use YouTube generally? Oh, oh, exactly, everyone, right? How many people do actually keep the YouTube playing with the next, play, uh, next video being played? That's what they're focusing on. They wanna make sure that you don't click on that cancel when um, they recommend you a video. That's the main focus of this paper. It's, it, I know it's the bar is important as well, but that's the main focus of the paper, is that next, wait, uh, next watch video. Um, there's approximately one billion parameters being learned in this model which is huge. Uh, training happens on billions of examples. Uh, test, so what the, the testing is done usually offline to try them to come up with the best model and then they do live A-B testing to refine and tune up the model to make sure it actually serves on, online or the A-B testing better. Um, and again, back to the implicit feedback, how many people watch uh, YouTube? How many people watch YouTube in the last week? Everyone? Probably, yes. How many people, you, sorry, what? I know, we're live on YouTube. How many people clicked on thumbs up or thumbs down the last week? So much less, much less number compared to how many people watch. That's why they didn't wanna do the explicit feedback. They wanted to do implicit. Implicit 
give you way more data than explicit. Explicit is either you did it or you didn't, and that's it. So the whole matrix or the whole, um, yeah, matrix is going to be very sparse. So you can come up with a very accurate model if you have a sparse matrix. And that's basically the problem with recommender systems in general, or actually any model. OK, so why is YouTube challenging? Yes? Feedback, okay, so, implicit, so the, question, the question is, what is implicit feedback? So implicit feedback is basically the interaction between the user and the, the item. So for example, if you buy an Amazon, it's how, how, what is the price of the, the product you bought it for? How many times did you view it before buying it? For all those details hidden behind the purchase or hidden behind the interaction, even if you didn't buy it, I still have that data, right? But if explicit feedback, I only know if you bought it or not. That's it. Or I only know how many ratings did you give it, right? So implicit is a bit extra information in the system. Um, so why is YouTube recommendations generally very challenging? Again, scale. It's huge. How many videos? There's billions of videos on YouTube. So it's impossible, not impossible, it's very hard to come up with a common default recommender system. By the way, just to clarify, because this really bugged me, this YouTube is not a recommender system. It's a multi-class classification, and they don't use any of the uh, normal uh, recommender system uh, techniques. So scale, they have a lot of videos, a lot of users. It's, um, it's very hard to, to, to use the very default ways, or the, the regular ways. Um, freshness, because how, like a lot of videos, I think they said, about, I actually made it up here. Yeah, 86,400 and 400 hours of videos being uploaded daily. So there's always new videos, there's always new content. And if you use, again, a default recommender system, it's, it's a bit hard to get these new videos into the system. Um, noise, again, because you can watch a lot of things. It depends on your mood. It depends on what you're watching, the time of the day. There's a lot of noises. Some, someone is using your YouTube, someone is using your uh, laptop. There's usually a lot of noises. So that's why um, these three are the main problems with uh, the YouTube recommendation. Well, not problems, challenges. OK, so as a structure, we can have a two separate models that help us to get to the perfect uh, uh, video to watch next. So the first one is the candidate generation. What it does from billions of videos, they somehow that they didn't mention the paper, I think. They now account to millions of videos. And from those millions of videos corpus, what they do is they pass it through the candidate generation that narrows it down from millions to hundreds of videos. So you're talking about a, like four digits, four zeros away, right? So this way, if I'm dealing with um, hundreds of videos, it's much, much, much easier than dealing with, uh, with millions of videos. And the focus in the candidate generation is precision. Again, precision is I want to make sure that the videos that I recommend to the user are relevant. I'm not sure if they're going to be watched next or not, but I know they are going to be relevant. Um, the second stage is the part where the, the ranking stage is basically from these 100 videos, they rank each one, making sure to see which one has the highest score that is going to be watched next. And that's going to be focusing on something called recall, which is the confidence that I'm going to be watching the video next. Um, so this is the overall structure. So we have about millions of videos here on the video corpus. And it goes to candidate generation, gets using the user history, narrows it down to hundreds, and then it passes through the ranking model. Again, uses the user history and the context. Context is basically the user watch history, uh, the data of the user and the video, the interaction between them. And using also the video features, it only recommends dozens. So it now this model now is down from millions to dozens with a higher column precision. That's, that's fascinating, to be honest. OK, so we're going to be focusing on the first model. The first model is the candidate generation. Again, it, it now is down from millions of videos to hundreds. How did they do that? Um, they use. Generally speaking, softmax classifier, but we're going to go through the steps. So in here, uh, the authors claim that it is considered to be nonlinear matrix, nonlinear generalization of matrix factorization. So matrix factorization is basically trying to predict what is the ratings um, 
between a user and an item if it's missing. This is somehow similar, but it's a nonlinear um, generalized method. Um, so what they do here is it's considered to be an extreme multi-class classification. What, what this is, basically each video is considered to be a class by itself. And I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to predict which class or which video is a given user going to be watching next, right? Um, so that's why it's multi-class uh, classification. And we have about a million video, millions of videos. So we have millions of classes. So I'm pretty sure most of you know how painful that part will be. Um, and this is the softmax classifier. So um, basically, for a given user, so user is u, and the vi is a video i, um, divided by the summation of all the videos for that given user. So basically, I'm trying to see from all the videos that the user watched um, or, or a given user, what are the probability that is going to be video x, video y, whatever. OK. so. There are millions of video classes, which um, I mentioned earlier. OK. So forget about positive. So they do negative classification. What this is is if I know that the user didn't watch a specific video, I'm going ne to label it as a negative. This helps a lot the classifier to ignore cases where we know right away that this is not going to be a good example. Right? So they do negative um, classification, and they try basically eventually to minimize the cross entropy. Um, so user watch history is different for each user. Right? So each user watch different videos at a given sort of time, and they watch different numbers of videos. So in here, what they did for that variable length, they used embeddings to make sure that um, these variable length are eventually, into, uh, are eventually given to the network through a fixed variable vector. Right? So if I watch 120 videos, someone else watched 70, I, don't wanna, I wanna make sure that both of us are given the same sized vector to be passed to the network. That's how the network uses its inputs anyways. So they use embedding for the users and the videos. Um, and all the features are eventually concatenated and fit into the first layer of Freelu. We're going to talk about the rest of the features. OK. OK. Um, yes. Yes. So in, in that embedding, like the video embedding you talked about, mm -hmm. so uh, what, what, what kind of embedding is like what, like click beat work? What kind of embeddings yeah. do you use? So I think from the, what the paper mentioned is they use a very lockup table, lookup table, but I don't exactly know the details of that. Um, but so do you mean what are the features in that embedding, or how do they oh, embed it? For so a lookup table. So if, if I can clarify, uh, the way they describe it is they, they borrow from language modeling. And they treat the video ID as a word and watch history as a sentence. So they're in basically doing word embeddings on video IDs. And so like the order of like the IDs is like with the watching. Exactly. So the, the so order of the IDs is what gives context for a certain work uh, a certain work. So right? there is a kind of like timing included in that kind of like Correct, embedding. yes.
Okay. So we're going to talk about for if so far about this. It was the long slide. Yes. Ask a question. Sorry. You talked about like a positive and negative glasses and say that negative glasses are related to the uh, videos you have never watched. Okay. <laughs> but sometimes on the right hand side you can see the videos you have never watched and uh, it's recommending it. So is it possible to like recommend the negative uh, glasses as well? So what I mean by negative sampling and never watch is something that it was recommended to you before, and you never watched it. So um, it's basically something that we, the YouTube system already recommended that, and it, th you didn't watch it before, right? So kind of like encourage you to see that video that you never played before, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. But another detail is there's this candidate generation <coughs> part, but there's also alternative sources oh. that could be videos that you've never watched or never been really recommended, and they, actually, they just don't go into it in the paper. Oh, it could just be like popular videos in the region. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you have a question so in the back? Mean a negative feedback thing in which if a user doesn't watch the video you recommend it, you never like you never give it again. I'm sorry. Can you can you? Uh, so is, is it more of like a negative feedback thing in which like if you recommend a video to a user and he doesn't watch it, then you never show that video again? No, they do show it again, but it gets lower score. Yes. So I think so actually, we're going to be answering that question a little bit later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, we're going to talk about the candidate generation model. So again, we embed all the, uh, we try to use embedded video watches and embedded fish talk tokens. And just to clarify, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but usually the user context is the last 50 videos watched and the last 50 fish tokens. So the last 50 searches and the last 50 video watched. Um, so because again, there's a million of classes. Uh, we do negative sampling, um, and then the user watch history is represented because it's very sparse and it's valuable length. We try to represent it using embedded um, vector. So, what happens to these embedded vectors is it gets averaged. So, the embedded watches and the search tokens they get averaged, they get concatenated together along with many other features. So, I think in here it was millions of features they, they talked about. Um, they didn't say all of them, but for example, they're using geographic embedding, so where's the, location, where's the user located at? Um, they use the age, so in age, they use it as a number, they square it. This gives you a bit more power. The model gets a bit more power in terms of trying to, um, the age is gonna have a bit more um, weight in trying to determine what kind of videos you wanna have. Um, they also use the gender, and eventually it's going to pa be passed to the neural network. So question? No. Okay. Um, okay, so the, all, the, all these layers, so the three ELU layers are fully connected network. So what I mean by this is this is going to be 1024, this is 512, and 256. And it goes through a fully connected three layers of ELUs, and then the score of that is going to be passed on either for training or serving, which we're going to be seeing next. So the, the, so the output of the ELUs, if, it is, if I'm just trying to train, I'm going to pass it to a softmax classifier, and the output of the softmax classifier is going to be probability of uh, video 1, video 2, up to video n. And if I'm trying to serve it, I'm going to take this probability and I'm going to try to find the nearest neighborhood for each user. So uh, what is the nearest, for a specific user, what is the nearest video for that, uh, that I can um, use for that specific user? So that's, this is the whole training and serving, and they use different systems for that. So this is one step, and this is totally a different step. Yes? So the video embeddings then are the output of a softmax? Say what? Are the video embeddings and then the output of the softmax? The video embeddings are the output of the softmax? That's your question? No. Well, this is what it seemed like um, when we were going through the paper mm -hmm. because they do approximate nearest neighbors and we think, and if anybody who wants to clear this up, feel free, um, we think the, they're calling it approximate nearest neighbors because they're taking the user embedding, putting it through softmax, calling those the vector embeddings. But then, but then, from what I understood, is um, they are passing in the video vector, but they are trying to find which ID, which video ID is the closest to a specific user. So it's not the embedding itself. That's what I understand about it. Oh, 
Uh, we can talk about it in the discussion. Cool. OK. Um, any other questions? Yes. So do you know anything about the size of the last layer? It yeah, it's 256. Oh, here it's 1024. So what is the size of uh, each of the layers? So this is a 1024, 512, 256. So at the output, we're going to have 256 classes? Yeah, 256. Or 256. Uh, no, 256, the, the, the size of the is going to be 256. So it's not 256 videos. If that's the output, there shouldn't be, if it's a classifier and that's the output, there shouldn't be the number of classes that we're getting at the output. The output of the e-book? So um, just to clarify, they this model exists in kind of two states. There's the, the static training state, and then there's actually serving results to a user. So in training, your output basically looks like a typical softmax, where we're saying this is the probability of the positive class being the video they watched. But in serving, what they're doing is they're taking the last layer weights and treating that as an embedding of the video. And the input embeddings are also jointly updated as they're training the model. If that clarifies, okay. that kind of two-part um, whether so that's going to be the, the last layer. That's going to be the input to the ranking model. Correct. Oh. Yes. Yes. Oh, I think there was a question. Yeah. So, what are the toolkits? Are they numeric value? They are new, so they are continuous. They are categorical. There's many different types of features in there. Do you mean the, the embedded search tokens at the bottom? No, the the, la, uh, the, the very first. Uh, yeah, the bottom layer these tokens, that the column tokens. If, all, all, all kind of okay, so my question is, uh, what's the guarantee that the averaging that you have is not gonna mix with other tokens? So that's, this is the step where, that, that's what they said about the, the old embeddings, is they make sure that it actually works yet. So that's, that's something on older paper they mentioned. That's how they use the embeddings and it always get them a good result. But, yeah, so they, they mentioned that they use multiple uh, variables types, so they use uh, continuous, categorical, nominal, ordinal. They use a lot of different features, and that's the main reason why they came up with embeddings couple, a couple of uh, um, years ago for YouTube, and that is because to be able to deal with these different data types. But, so yes. Is there any chance that this, this kind of mixed with other tokens? It will be mixed with other tokens? I don't think so. Why would it be mixed? Yeah, another token with the same average is going to be the same, right? But I'm averaging each of... Could you repeat the question? Okay, so basically the, uh, the, the next question is saying um, the tokens are going to get mixed because we're using the average, right? Yeah. Yes. The, the, what, I, what, I, what I'm saying is they're, not, they're averaging each of the videos being watched like by itself, right? So how is it going to get mixed? Clarify. So each of those averages that's happening, so we have the embeddings for all of the videos in your watch history. So we're only averaging together the embeddings of the videos. And then we only average together separately the embeddings of your searches. They tokenize the searches into unigrams and bigrams, embed those tokens. And that. So those average vectors are the average of the videos you've watched in the past. And that makes sense, right? Because if you and I watch different like tangential videos and I watch cooking videos, you watch soccer videos, but we both watch a lot of machine learning videos. So because those are all embedded in the same vector space, the average will come, will come closer up. together, if that helps clarify. Yeah. What they're doing at the end, if they're updating these through backprop, is they are considering those other demographic variables into the embedding and using that information to update. That makes sense. Thank you. I have another question. Yes. You mentioned that you're doing a multi-class classification. Yes. How do they define the classes? Like how many classes? Videos. Each video is a class. Each video one class? Yes. Like millions of classes? Yes. So that's <coughs> exactly what they said. That's why they said actually some time ago it's extreme multi-class classification. Um, somewhere, no. Uh, so they say they're going to see this video or not, yes. other video or not. Yeah, uh, not yes or no. So it's not a binary system. They give it a score for each specific video, right? And they and they come up with, system. yes. 
it's a it's a probability that's the video you're going that, to watch next. Yes, that's and why when we it say, goes to Fuff Max classify. Yeah, and when we say each video is a class, there are millions of videos, but again, similar to language modeling, we sample a small group of negatives. So we're not going over the entire list of videos. We're saying, okay, we take a hundred videos that we know you haven't watched, and we're going to score those as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the question is like, you know, I was I want to make sure that my understanding is correct. So you you embedded uh, this is a diagram for each user, right? Yes. So you embedded the videos for each user. So as last, the output would be like an embedding of the what the u the user will watch or the, what what the user would be look like. I mean, it's like working like a duck to wake or no? It's like the the output of this camera mm -hmm. generation is like what is the it gives you a weighted vector of the video for for what comes out of it if it tries it goes to a soft max classifier and now you're going to get a probability for each video right so probability of video one because that we're passing each user pa uh, like all the videos for each user passes passes to a soft max classifier and the output of it is you try to find which other user has a very close um, embedded vector like like the, the current user. So it's the nearest neighborhood between a user and a video. So you already train it based on what, what he has already watched. I mean, like, it, yes. it gets already like, so why do we need that? Because, you know, you say that we want to do a generation, okay, so we want to narrow down. Narrow the, down. Right? Yes. But you're already using what he has, I mean, you're using the scores that he has already... So I'm generating scores, right? So I'm generating scores for all the videos for a specific user. But then I have the power to choose how many videos do I want to pass next. So the, the point of the candidate generation is precisely choosing, let's say, 100 videos to go through the ranking model. Like, up until now, this is the half of the system, right? All oh, what I care about now is the relevancy of the videos to a user. That's it. Yes. Can you clarify how this uh, such a fixed model can deal with various uh, videos? Uh, I mean, if they're like every every day a lot of new videos come in, how can such a fixed model, such a multi-class classification deal? That will that will come next. Oh. That will come next. Yes. Um, so yeah, so it's, we're trying to minimize the like it's uh, it's being trained using back propagation, trying to minimize the uh, gradient descent, and at first thing it's approximately near <coughs> neighbor, a neighborhood. So basically, it's trying to generate 100 of candidate video recommendations for a specific user. OK, so an important part in the training step in the candidate generation is what goes into training, right? So if I search for something, and luckily the recommender system all says you're going to watch that video, it's unfair because I already made the, 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 the model knows exactly what I'm going to be looking for. So what happens in here is it tries to take everything before the label into the training step. So it tries to use the training as everything before a label. That includes the watch history and the search tokens, right? Um, because again, we don't want any recommendation leakage. Um, so in here, for example, if I have a label here, I'm going to pass everything before and everything after. I'm not going to pass anything that is being labeled. This way, I'm making sure that my recommendation is generic and it's not being biased. Is there any questions about that? Cool. OK. Um, so that was the candidate generation. Now we have n videos that are relevant. What to do next? Right? So we need now to rank them based on how confident am I going to have that specific user watching the specific or particular video. So again, in here, we're focusing on making sure the recall is high. In the previous step, the candidate generation, we made sure the precision is high, but in here we're making sure the recall is high. Recall is the confidence that a specific user is going to be watching that video. Um, so the final ranking is constantly being tuned based on live A-B testing, right? So we train it using uh, offline, but then eventually we also have to, uh, or they do, uh, they always try to tune it based on the A-B, live A-B results. Um, again, it's going to be only logistic regression, so it's not too complicated in the terms of activation function. So again, as previous features could be categorical, continuous, ordinal, and in here, it could be univariate and multivariate. So categorical is something that 
is just categories. So red, blue, green, there's no specific order between them. Um, continuous is a continuous data where there is numbers. You can have any number between two numbers. And ordinal is a categorical data where there is specific sequence. So high is better than medium, better than low. And a univariate is basically something that outputs only a single variable or something that is uh, a variable that is contributing to a single uh, additional variable, while multivariate is something that contributes to many other variables um, later on. So hundreds of features are used in the ranking models, and it's roughly split evenly between continuous and categorical data. Uh, it's important that they, they observe that it's very important to pass the results of the candidate generation as features, not only as results. So the features of the candidate generation is also used in the ranking uh, model. Um, embeddings are used to map a sparse categorical features into um, dense fixed size representation. And if the cardinality video IDs are too large, so something I'm watching too many videos, um, I'm going to take the last n into consideration, or the, they are going to take the last n into consideration, and that n was 50. Um, so that includes the search and the video being watched. So in here, again, impression video ID is the, ID, is the video that is being automatically played next, right? Uh, so this is what they mean by impression video ID. Watch video IDs is for a specific user, all the videos, all the end videos that a user has been watching in a specific window of time. Um, so what happens here is it goes to a video embedding. So this impression video ID goes to a uh, video embedding. And the watch video IDs, as we did in the candidate generation, it gets averaged. And then it gets concatenated with the impression ID. They also have the language embedding. So what is the user? Uh, language and what are the vi what is the video language? Uh, they also use the time since last watch and they have the power for the square root, uh, the power one and the square again to make sure that they can grab any smaller or granular details of the time being watched, and they normalize it. They do the same thing for the previous impressions and they normalize it. All of these concatenated with many other features. Um, it basically goes through the first three layer again. Yes. Just a note about the <clears throat> number of previous impressions. Mm -hmm. So this is the point where they're introducing some form of negative feedback here. So if you remember, <clears throat> sorry. Um, right now, YouTube, they only care about if you actually watched a video or not. So if you thumbs up, thumbs down, that's explicit feedback, but they don't really care. This is just focusing on um, implicit. So. This is the only point where you can actually give some feedback. So if you saw the video, or if the video showed up in your recommended column, or like on your homepage and you didn't actually watch it, that would be negative feedback that's fed into this model. Good point, thank you. So all these uh, vectors or features concatenated together goes to the ReLU layer, which again, the same size as before, 1025, uh, 512, 256, and again, same concept as earlier, the training and serving steps are different, right? So for the training, they just use weighted logistic regression. They do, again, back propagation. They try to minimize the loss, a very basic training example. For serving, they try to f uh, recommend, so they, they rank the items based on the highest ranking. So the video with the highest ranking is going to, uh, or highest rating, is going to be the one that is being played automatically next. Um, this is the overall structure. So, yeah, in the training parameters, back propagation by minimizing the logistic regression, and in serving the video ID with or the video with the highest scores gets recommended. Okay. Yes. I don't know how many slides have passed. Um, so Heo is asking, can you explain what exactly is tuned through A/B testing? So what exactly is what? Is for all the parameters, right? Because so the question is, what is exactly being tuned to live A-B testing, right? So um, in a recommended system, you can only train the model based on the data you have. But you can never know if it's going to perform well on live 
uh, event or not. So the only way to actually tune them back is you take the results of the live A-B testing and you retrain the whole model using these results. That's the, the whole parameters are being um, basically tuned again. So it's not a specific variable in this case. Um, any other question? Okay. Yes. Um, with the time watched, mm. uh, do you know, like say I start at the beginning of a video and then I skip ahead a bunch and watch a little bit and then I skip and watch some more, does it look at the time that I, like on terms of the timeline of the video or it looks on the number of seconds I watched well, total? It looks like, like, like from a, a start time in history to a stop time in, in Okay, so just to say the question again, the, the question is, um, if I skip parts of the videos, does it consider that I watched the whole video or not? No. So they actually consider how much time did you consi consistently watch through the video. That's actually one of the presentations about that, so yes. Okay. Um, so last slide, is it observed that uh, Yes, so it is important again to pass the information um, from the, the candidate generation step and the features as well. And I think we already covered through this uh, slide anyways. So for now we're going to have a five minute break and after that we're going to talk about the results and the discussion points. We'll have five minus two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Because in the video that the author did, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, yeah, the.
So now we're going to talk about um, the results for each of the models, so for the candidate generation and the ranking model. And for the first one, there's very limited things we did, but it is very important to figure out what is the effect of the width, the width of the features and the depth of it, right, so of the network. So in here it's saying adding, adding, featured, uh, uh, adding features, so basically the width and the depth of the network imp helps to improve the, um, the, ac the precision. But again, that's always most of the times the case. So as based on what they said, and they just gave it like that, this is the most optimum thing they came up with. Um, so what has been trained is a vocabulary of 1 million video and 1 million first tokens were embedded with a 256 flow to the maximum back size because that's the size of the last layer of the ELU. Um, with the 50 and the back size of 50 recent watch and 50 searches. So that's the window that they are looking at. And they did it for all YouTube users and they kept maintaining it up until it converged. Um, so the result is if they only use the watches, this is the the, the mean, uh, so MAP is the mean average precision. And if they do it to only the watch watches only, it's gonna be a low precision. If they do it using only watches and searches, this is what it is. If they include the um, age, for example, this is what it is. If they include all the features that they included, it comes up with the highest accuracy, which is about 12% in this case. Um, and again, this is the network depth. So this is when it's one, two, three, and four. And in this case, their point of view is um, when, if we try to use four, it's a lot more um, CPU and running time than required for, and there's no huge improvement, so we're gonna set it with three. Um, so this is for the candidate generation uh, features, basically. And now we're going to be talking about the ranking step. For the ranking step, um, basically the results show increasing uh, the width and the depth in the same concept increases the results, but CPU time is increased as well. Um, and the second thing is the reason why they came up with these sizes is they tried with using no ELU, so just the output of the features as it is, and they tried um, basically, so uh, they tried coming up with the weighted uh, loss per user, and it was 41.6. If they tried one single net, uh, one single layer of 256, um, 36.9, and it kept improving as as much as when we increased the number of neurons and increased the number of depth, it kept increasing up until each 34.6 percent. And they said that um, even putting deeper network improve it, but it takes exponential time in the reading, uh, in the running time or training time. Um, so that's it for the results. Now the discussion. Um, for the first thing that we have in here, and thanks for seeing. Can you just clarify some points from the paper? Okay, sure. I just wanted to go back to the deep candidate generation model part because when you look at the architecture, again, maybe this is just me misunderstanding and rationalizing it and then continuing to misunderstand, but it really looks like they're obtaining the um, video vectors from the softmax because the arrow is coming from there. So, I mean, I understand it now, but could you just clarify it for anybody yes. else? So, I understand that the, um, the, the arrows coming out of the softmax classifier, so maybe if it came right away from the ELU, it would make more sense. But from what I understand about the paper, if this softmax, the two, it's going to be outputting a 256, um, va 256 uh, sized vector and for each video and these vectors are going to have those weighting based on each video, right? And then it's going to be mapped to the nearest neighborhood trying to find which user is going to be the closest to. So it's not going to be the, 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 the probability, it's just going to be a vector of 256 and each of those is going to be the weight uh, for, for that specific video. Um, yes? That's going to be a vector of 1 million each or? 256. So because the last layer is 256, right? How? Yeah. So it's going to be million vectors, but each vector is 256 size. Does that make sense? So that's not number of neurons at the last layer? So that's 256 is the number of neurons at the last layer, yes. The embedding space yeah. is 256, right? The embedding dimension for that. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
I think the output should be, each output should be one embedding a space. In my, uh, I'm not sure, but you know that's what I'm thinking. Kind of makes sense. Maybe well, could, you, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. So, um, um, but it's a soft max. So, <clears throat> so what I'm thinking is the output is a vector of uh, one million videos, and now we have 256 of them. The classifier goes through 256, and then you know we pick the highest rating. Would no. that work? Or? No, no, that's okay. So we start with million videos. Yes. That's the overall for all users, right? So this is given a single user. So I'm going to take all the video watches, all the fish talking for that specific user, which is 50 and 50, right? I'm going to pass it. I'm going to average it. I'm going to concatenate. And this last layer is 256. The size of it is 256, which is going to output a vector of size 256. That's yeah. just that's the dimension of it. The, yeah. What does it represent? That's the weight. The weights depend, um, these are the weights after basically the, the learning happens. Yeah, weights for what? For a specific video. But for weights for a specific video, you're going to need a vector of 1 million size, no? We are not using a vector of 1 million size, we're using a vector of 256 size. So, um, <coughs> just to clarify, so this, this entire network architecture, so you're using this, the same network for all of your examples, right? So given this average of the user's watch history and the user's search history and all of these other variables, that last RELU layer is basically a embedded representation of the user. And then the softmax classifier is given that embedding of a user, what are the probabilities that they are going to watch Each whichever time. video? So we, let's say, I don't know how many videos they sampled for negative examples, but you have one video that we know they're going to watch next, which is their true label, and some samples of negative videos, and we get probabilities from those. The confusion here, though, is at that softmax layer, they have an mm -hmm. arrow coming out saying, so the last ReLU layer, that's your user. But what's coming out of the softmax is they're saying, this is now a video embedding, if that makes sense. So for every example you pass through, you get a user and you get a video. And that's the embedding of the video that they are going to watch, watch. next. Does that clarify? Because I'm confused yeah. about this too, because this diagram makes it kind yeah. of hard. Yeah. Yeah. It throws it off. It throws it off. Actually, yeah. you got confused already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, yes. you know, so the output was, is like an output for a user or for the video? Well, so this is for a, so the output of, so the top layer activations of that ReLU stack. Right. That is a vector that represents everything we know about a user. But we also so it's like a doc to Vic, but instead of a document, we have it for user, but we have it like fancier. Yeah, because yeah. what you're trying to do in that, that nearest neighbor index is you're trying to find what user documents are closest to what movie documents. Movie documents. Right, right, right. I'm sorry, I don't know NLP, so he knows that. Uh, that's why I, I don't know it. NLP. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is that, um, in an earlier slide, you had uh, the the probability, the little equation you had yeah. in an earlier slide, that one? Yes. And is that what you're saying is the? Softmax. That, that's, that's the softmax. softmax. Yeah. That's about the users on top and so the videos are on the bottom? No, the, no. that's the, the, user, the interaction between a specific user and a video. Yeah. And the this content. is that's the, 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 user, the user with all the videos he watched okay. or she watched. So it's, it's, it's sorry, when you have like, for example, when you have a dog to wake up, People who have a, a, a very, because it's a person is not a document, you know, he doesn't have Maybe a. Maybe start to speak up. Yeah. Okay. Very a, per, loud. A, a person is not like a document. He doesn't have a, this consistent, uh, for example, favorite thing. He has multiple things. Yes. Which are favorite, right? Mm -hmm. So when you cannot condense all of his I understand all of his favorite topics like into one thing. Okay. So can you do such a thing? And how accurate? So think about how um, traditional recommender systems work. Given a matrix where it's a 2D matrix, so well, your columns are your users and your um, rows are your items. Right. So you factorize that and you get an embedding of a user and an embedding of an item in the same space. So we're treating them as embeddings in the same vector space, really, and we multiply those and get a score of how similar they are or what we estimate their likelihood to their value to be, whatever it is, whatever the surrogate problem is. So basically, after that, doing that product with all these different things that the user like, 
again, it's going to be recommending whatever has the highest value. And these keep from getting changed depending on what if the domain that you watch most recently or how many times did you watch it. It just keeps on updating based on your interaction with the video, right? So it, it, get, it gets updated as well. OK. Yes? Just to clarify, so in the end, this, this first model is going to pick those movies whose movie vectors have the highest inner product with the user vector. That's what, what the first thing is Yes, doing. exactly. So it is doing a very similar way to matrix factorization because that is what matrix factorization does, right? It gets that specific user embeddings and that specific value embeddings and just dark product them. It's exactly doing the same thing. Can you explain what is then different in the second stage? Like how is that different from the first one? Is so, it just more detail? Sure. So the first stage is or what I'm doing is I'm getting the precision, right? I'm just trying to find what are the most um, similar users to two videos, right? So just using the nearest neighbor, I'm doing dark product between the user vector and the video vector, right? But for the candidate, for the ranking algorithm, I am trying to give that specific video a specific score depending on the, like the impression video ID is I'm trying to, to given all the history of the user, given the metadata of the video, I'm trying to give it a specifically a score if it's going to be watched next or not. Yes. So it's weighted logistic regression, and specifically the weights are, for every positive example, the weight is the amount of time that the user spent watching that video. And because of those weights, that means at serving time, they're actually predicting the amount of time they expect someone to watch, watch. some video. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. Try to, the, like, the, to re find out an explanation for the latent representations because I guess the re latent representations would be like something like the topics that a person likes, right? Isn't that the case? I mean, have I tried that? No, no I mean in the paper, not you. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so I don't think they they dig into that much details in the paper about it, but I would suggest it something like. Again, it's just weight depending on the topic. Right? Well, speak about it. Uh, this is how Google and specifically YouTube and all of their content services have operated for a long time because embeddings are just really convenient because you can fit them down to a fixed size and you can just add in whatever the other features you want. Um, I'm sure they've done a lot of work on understanding what different embeddings mean, but in this paper they say we use it because it's what we do and it works. Because for example, you want to make space where you can do like add and some arithmetics have meanings. Yeah. Have they tried such a thing in here? I mean, like, I don't, I don't think so. And that doesn't hold for like matrix factorization, right? You can't add two products together and get close to another product in general the same way you can with something trained specifically for that to work. Oh, yeah. So, domain difference in here. Yes. Um, any questions about that discussion point? Okay. Let's go back to the next. Okay, so that was what could be, for so the first one, what could be changed to, so just, just to recap, the point of this um, paper is to make sure that they're recommending a video that you are going to watch next. But they are not focusing on something with generalized recommendations, right? So what I mean by that is if I watch, for the example, last two days football games, for the coming two days, it's going to be, again, football games recommendations, right? And maybe that is something that is not an ideal. So using this system or maybe editing it and modifying it, what could, be, what could be done to generalize those recommendations? So it doesn't only look at the most recent um, videos, or it doesn't only recommend me the next video to watch, but something more generalized. That's one discussion point. Um, of course, in any recommender system, that's the easiest discussion point. What can be done in a cold stack problem, right? Because I, they use a lot of metadata, uh, or they use a lot of user features um, to come up with the nearest neighbor for a video, right? So I personally think this is not an easy task for them for the cold start, but I remember one of my facilitators said they take care of it. Um, so that's my second discussion point. The last one is. So we did averaging for the embeddings, right? Um, for the video embedding, for the user embeddings. Could we use attention instead of averaging? Could we use um, anything other than averaging? So these are the discussion points, and the floor is open now. Anyone can answer anything. <laughs> yes. 
I know you want to. No. no. Well, I guess. Okay. With with averaging, you lose on like you lose time series data, right? Yes. Like it it might matter the order that I watch videos in. Um, for for. And I guess the, like, I don't think this would pick up on anything like that. Yeah. But why wouldn't attention do that again? Well, attention oh, might. Attention yeah. would. Yeah. yeah. Attention would, right? Yeah. Okay. So, for. Yeah. Attention ahead. is like exactly what it sounds like. It's in given a sequence of things, fine. Pay attention to the one that's most important. Yeah. But uh, if we uh, go back to the diagram of how they selected their training labels, there and you guys can test this at home. It's actually kind of fun. If you go to any like topic on YouTube that you're interested in, be it a, an artist or uh, you can just start at like the most general uh, Android NG machine learning video that you can find. Uh, if you start clicking the watch next, the watch next, the watch next, eventually you're going to get to a very, very obscure part of machine learning. And it's always super interesting. And so they have kind of attacked the same aspect of the problem, but rather than using a certain mechanism, they just train to the next video. And they specifically talk about this kind of, uh, what are they, what's the word they use? Um, asymmetric co-probability yeah. of, of video watches, but just basically what they're saying is videos that are a series, you're going to watch them in order. Mm -hmm. And videos on a topic, you're going to explore into more niche areas. So attention would be kind of attacking the same thing, maybe in an interesting way. I'm surprised they didn't talk about it at all, yeah. but the way they do it, they get good results. Um, and I also think um, attention would all, probably always go right to the most recent video you watched. But it's going to be that, a similar topic. Yeah, I probably. think if they use attention, it's going to even make the cold start problem way worse. And I, I, that's what I have figured out from recommended systems that use attention. Cold start problem is much harder to solve. So it's. You said. Uh, I, I guess attention is more computationally expensive than averaging. Yeah, but that's Google. <laughs> it's, not, it's not too too expensive. It's just another softmax, so it is expensive. But over here, it's just three history, right? Three items in the history, given or two items in the history. Wait. How many items do you look back? Fifty. Fifty. Okay, so that's slightly. <laughs> but um, but as compared to like NLP, that's like five hundred thousand vocabulary size or fifty thousand vocabulary size. That's much better. Um, a quick, also because it was discussed, so attention per se doesn't have, is not order sensitive, mm -hmm. but it could sort of tackle the same issue by saying, oh, this is more important than this, right? Um, that's it. <laughs> yes, there is a problem with attention here, because we are doing negative, like how, how the way that we are going to train it, is, it's based on this negative sampling. So. I, I don't know how 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 to train like uh, attention when our loss function is based on negative sampling. So like then it becomes very important how we are providing those negative samples, isn't it? It's like. But why? Still, the negative samples are just going to be the watch the videos that I didn't watch before, right? So how is it? I I don't understand how is that complicating uh, it. So if it's pop. Either it's a positive instance or a negative instance. It's going to come down to uh, a history of 50 tokens, was it? Yes. It's going to come down, come down to that, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's positive or negative, the network uh, can weight the items in the sequence and decide which one is more effective in helping it making the right decision, no matter if it's like negative or, or a positive one. And yeah, all what, attention. What if we select like different negative samples, then, so then we get different attention. Is it, so attention would you would be running the the historical watch vectors through this attention step, right? So I'm forgive me, I'm not familiar really with it, but how does that affect how we're selecting our samples? Because I thought it was you're trying the attention is trying to find what in that history of watches is most important in telling you the probabilities of those times. Yes, so it, it tells me this is the positive one. So in selecting this positive one, these are the ones which okay. are important. And I then these them. are the negative ones. And that's why, mm -hmm. because of this important. So but each data point is given it um, uh, at a different uh, time than the other data. So a negative sample would go in. 
independent from where a positive sample will go, right? Um, so each time you, you feed a, a data point in, you will form that history of 50 tokens. Each one has embeddings, right? Those embeddings will inform the attention layer, and the atten attention layer can choose to attend over those embeddings. What will, so you, you're saying that I think uh, the regime, because you're using ne negative sampling, the regime will be more diverse uh, because you have, uh, but, th but that, that doesn't stop attention from learning uh, because those, uh, the, the embedding space is meaningful. So if you're closer in embedding space um, to this other point, uh, then if, you, if you're going to pay attention to point A uh, and it would help you, Paying attention to point B, which is close in embedding, said would would just help as much. So uh, that said, I, I don't think that's uh, just just to add up again. They they clearly said in one of their videos is averaging or summing or doing pairwise addition multiplication. It's not going to change anything. So I that's what they actually said in the video, right? In my opinion, I think. They, that's basically just a way of saying we just tried averaging and it worked good. I still want an answer for the cold start problem. <laughs> like, yes? What do you mean by cold start? Is that like I'm a brand new user? Yes, so cold yeah. start is basically if I'm a brand new user with no data or a brand new video with no data, but they take care about the video part. Yeah. Um, how can I get this user recommendations, personalized recommendations right away, right? That's what Preston was saying earlier when I asked. So they, they do talk a little bit about falling back on like geographic and time of day and what device you're using. But um, they don't really um, so much tackle the cold start problem for videos as find a way to, like they don't really solve for it. They just kind of find a way to work into it. So what they describe is, let's say you're watching YouTube and um, Amir uploads a brand new video on a cool machine learning topic, but nobody's ever seen it before. What it's going to do is it's basically just going to say, a new video was uploaded. Let's try and figure out who and what demographic we think should watch it, and just inject it into their results to be ranked. So they're basically just tossing in alternate sources, skipping over that candidate generation step. And that's their solution. So show it to enough people quickly enough that people watch it so we can start actually making predictions about it. But that's for the video. Yes. So the videos wasn't a problem because they figure out a way to right away integrate those new videos into, um, into the system. But my point was about the user, right? So if, if it's a brand new or like very new user, more than half of this input is gone. So I have no idea how they tackle that problem. We just hope you watch enough videos that we can start making force, recommendations. Force them to watch videos, I guess? The most common uh, common videos with that, because for example, I have used uh, how, YouTube how? recently on a new machine, and it was like, they didn't know who am I, so it, what I got was like popular videos from all yeah. one place. Like, it's like, okay, the, the average people, if I don't know anything, it's more probable that you watch these things. You know, I was like, so that's, that's generally the. Pop and this sort of like, everybody yes. would watch. So that's the generally the go-to when you don't know, when you have a cold set problem, is recommend the most popular video for the past 10 days, right? But again, that's the easy out approach. Is there any like better details? Yes. Also should be some sort of waiting in the process, like you have features, you don't know about like uh, thousands of your features, but you have like 100 features about the users and you try to model that and now you're increasing the weights on those features. Would that be a possibility? So you mean initialize the weight with yeah. some weight? You give them, yeah, for this feature, you give them higher weights. With, sorry, what feature? Like for you example, have? you have my age, you have yeah. my gender, you have my geographic location. Yes. That's part of my profile, right? But again, that's not personalization, right? So just, is, we're just talking person. initial. Yeah. Okay. So it's not going to be perfect initially because you don't know the person yet. It's like yeah. if I just met you, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you as a person some gross generic questions until I know something about you and now I can ask better questions. Yes. So again, that, that, that's the reason why the discussion point is I don't think there's, an, there's a way out of studying as Parham and um, he said, Asad? Asad. Asad. Um, said basically 
try with focusing more on the features that you have for geographic embedding, age, gender, and the popular videos out. I think that's the easy way out of it, but. Yeah, just to the, clarify, the author, one of the authors of this paper gave this, or presented this at Rexis, and he just said it's simply the way they address the cold start problem for users is we know where they are, so we have the geographic information, we know their gender, and we know various other How features the about them, and then, <laughs> well, you're supposed to fill in your gender. I mean, they take everything they know about the user, and then they just use popular videos, popular searches, and then that's it, because they know a bit about the user, they're able to say, here's personalized recommendations. I guess the easy way is try using incognito mode and open YouTube and see what comes up to you. <laughs> there, there is a, a line in this paper where they have a field that says, is the user logged in or not? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking was, well, if the user wasn't logged in, they shouldn't know anything else about you from any of those other variables. <laughs> and it kind of makes it sound like that's not the case. So. <laughs> oh, it's cookies. Yeah, most of the time, you know, the, like the store information your computer, they know yeah. what mm -hmm. you have watched the past. I mean, it seems like the way the system is set up that once you have put in one search result, it becomes very valuable. Like, it yes. might be very skewed towards just you search one thing, yes. right? But you're already on YouTube. You're going to use it. It's going to start, like, like once you put in that one thing, the system is going to, like, kind of, like, it's an actually pretty good, like, way for, like, it's not cold. It's, like, mild. Give it size of Amazon like, or YouTube. It's a problem they don't even have to worry about at this point. They're like, hey, you're going to use it eventually. Yeah. It's fine. Why worry about it? But the question would be, is normal metrics factorization better at cold start? Oh. I would say yes. You think so? Yeah. It because for metrics factorization, for metric factorization, even if I know nothing about the user and he, like that specific user didn't read any of the items, I can still get some generalization based on the watch, right? But then for so technically the cold start problem is solved in a much better approach than here. That's from my perspective. I don't know. When you like the case that you're talking about, what dimensions were you dealing with? Like how many users, how many items were you dealing with? Of course not not the five. Yeah, I imagine if it's like I don't this know, like thousand users, a thousand items, maybe you could get something that's fairly yeah. good, but at this Not scale, I feel I like it would be a bit difficult. Sure, sure. Yeah. And that's one of the YouTube challenges. Yes. Any estimate of, for example, how does it take from going to like completely popular to nothing, no, to like personalized recommendations? How long does, how much should I interact with oh, the yeah. system? Like I actually, that they, they mentioned about it, and I think it takes for a video to, to basically pass that hype, I think it was five days. I think yeah, what the question is days. related to how, as a user, how many how many watches do I need to have? Provides you like a personalized recommendation. So again, they are using the well, video. Right yeah, they are using the video embedding, right? So you might see it next, because they are using um, most of it is the embedded videos and watch token. Right? Oh, so you you start for example one video, then it starts to generate. Oh, yeah. Now how. How long it takes to get a broad sense of what you like. If you have multiple interests, but you only go to YouTube to watch machine learning videos, then you're going to wonder why. Why isn't it showing me cooking videos? I want to see cooking videos. But as soon as you go and you go to your way to search that, right. then they're going to know. Right, right. Okay. So let me put it back to the discussion point because. Uh, we covered attention already. Yeah, so I think we covered the point. Uh, yes? I was asking like a slightly different question. So like the set of all videos seems to have like a rich graphic structure, not just like hierarchical, but also like some videos recommending other videos implicitly within the video itself. Yes. Is there any way that YouTube could like can harvest that information as well? Or? So that's, that's what they, that's what they, the reasoning behind averaging was that, because they're saying that a lot of times um, if, you, if you watch video A, you're going to eventually watch video B. Right? And for some reason, averaging actually takes this um, relationship into perspective. That's the, the averaging of the embeddings, right? Because it makes sense. Because if you watched it, I watched it, then, and I watched the next video, and so many users did the same thing, you're going to get recommended it. That's, that's the property of averaging, right? They also talk a bit about um, making sure that the model isn't trained to exploit the yes. site, the structure of the site. Because if you think about YouTube videos as a graph, just anecdotally, I would think 
the connections between videos in, a, in the same channel would be very strong. Those would be kind of your, your um, subgraphs. So if you had a recommender system that I watch, I watch some channel, and now I, all I see is that, I think they'd want to avoid that. They'd want to kind of try and break out of subgraphs and go into different areas, different communities. So they don't want to recommend part two of seven, part three of seven, and so on. No, they do. They do, but not, um, once you get to the end of that series, they don't want to recommend something in the same channel necessarily. Yes. They might want to get you somewhere else. <coughs> it's open for now, yes. What about advertising? Because you see that some videos pop up higher because I, at least I suspect they're paying mm -hmm. You yeah. too. Mm -hmm. So where does that factor into that model? So the advertisement is not in the recommended system part. So what I understand about advertising is basically if this what if this video is usually watched n times, we're gonna put this kind of advertisement. But it's not incorporated in the recommended system. Um, However, they have a. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was gonna say quickly related to your question, your question about advertising. So because they're trying to predict maximum watch time and like if there's two videos that are candidates, one of them, the model predicts that you'll watch it for 10 minutes, the other one, the model predicts you'll watch it for five, they're gonna recommend that you, the one that you would potentially watch for 10, and that's a business decision because they can put more ads in that 10 minute video than they can in that five minute video. So it's sort of, your question is sort of comes into play. I was thinking more like when people um, maybe pay YouTube to yeah, like I don't. Do they do that to get more hits? They do. The promotion things, right? Maybe there's like a rebate that occurs, or it's a separate source. Yeah, there's a metric on YouTube um, because you know my company has a partnership with YouTube, so we're getting a lot of reporting data. So not all the videos are the same. But there are videos. Uh, this metric, you know, um, tells you how much uh, revenue one you know one particular me uh, video uh, make. And sometimes one video could be 20 times than the other, you know, more than the other video. So I think there's an incentive for the system to kind of, you know, recommend the high um, profit in the videos more than the other videos. Is that revenue to the channel, like the channel owner, or, or to video, YouTube? video itself. Of the revenue? Yeah, where does the revenue go? The, the so part of it goes to YouTube, part of it goes to the, the channel okay. owners. How or if they're, they're, you know, companies in between. Related? They cut their shirts. Just, how does advertising fit into it? Because they would want to promote yeah, yeah, yeah. what generates more revenue. Yeah. Okay. I would, if I had to guess, I would say they get that user vector from like the, the top level activations, and that's going to really help decide: do we show you this ad? Because it doesn't make sense to advertise to somebody if you're you're sure they're not interested. Because then they're going to go, ah, I don't want. I'm going to install AdBlock, and then Google says, well, it's based on Chromium now, so you can't do that. Good luck. I don't think YouTube has a like a promote this video. Yeah, kind of they thing. don't have that uh, function. Uh, as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. It's just like you get paid for, per view. Yeah. Yeah. As another sort of high level point to add to the discussion, this is from 2016. So this is how YouTube used to do their recommendations, but apparently now they're they use some more RN, RNN based model, and they also do look at. Um, thumbnails now. Mm -hmm. So with this model, they're completely ignoring thumbnails, but now they kind of seem to be caring more about clickbait for whatever reason. What's thumbnails? What's thumbnails? Oh, like you know when you there's like pictures. your YouTube homepage, homepage. There's like little pictures of the video that you'll click on, oh, and you go to the oh, yeah, that's the. Oh thing. yeah, that's yeah. one of the features you know that they consider too. If there is like a lot of racist stuff on the thumbnails, like, they're not going to recommend that to users, and that's. That's other models that you know, looking into the thumbnails and the content itself. Hmm. And one other, you know, general questions. I don't know. That's a problem with uh, with the model on my cell phone, which is not maybe. <laughs> so I think they have updated this model, but sometimes, you know, like my um, my understanding was, if there is a video impression on my channel on my homepage, I don't watch the video. Um, I'm not going to be able to see it again. But is that um, the problem right now is, you know, I dislike, like, I unsubscribe, you know, from, from a channel. I dislike, you know, a couple of videos. But I'm still, you know, seeing videos, you know, from that channel. And um, I don't know what could be the uh, explanation for Try that. Try disliking them. Huh? <laughs> Try disliking them. Yeah. Have you but watched them? So I watched them in the past, the but I unsubscribed. But I guess if you and Every time, you know, like, I click and then I say that it's not relevant. You see, you know, there's this, um, this uh, option thing. 
but yeah, um, I don't know why I still you know get like. Um, but you, you're clicking on them. Maybe they're. For oh, that's. The I'm not. No, I get the impression, but I don't watch them, and then I don't want to see them. Yes. You know, so I click. I say this is not relevant, yes. and I and I've done this like you know for five six times. I still get you know like videos in the recommendation for that channel. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I get it. It comes back to Yes, negative yes. <laughs> Very strange. There's going to be so many more negative examples, though, than positive examples. That it probably learns a lot more from you watching it once than you not watching it yes. times. Yeah, maybe well, that's one of the downsides. Click at it once. I think that the fact that you clicked at it is way overcoming saying that it's not relevant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I should talk to you too. <laughs> 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 you. <laughs> yes. Uh, did the paper mention anything about compounding, uh, like malicious use of this uh, type of uh, like model? Like companies that are able to recognize ways that they're able to, like there's botting systems on YouTube. Like there's ways that people try to promote malicious content. Uh, or was that discussed at all? Or? No, they didn't bring it up in the paper. The closest that I see is them talking about the difference between like how far into the video you get versus how much time you actually spent watching it. So you don't just have bots and click the end of the video. Watch the whole thing. You yeah. don't like this video, but they don't really go into anything else. Okay. Any other question from the people that didn't ask? Amir is going to start pointing names now. <laughs> no? Of course I am. Here you go. <laughs> Amir, do you have any questions? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Online question. Like, you mentioned this already? I, I wasn't listening entirely, but this is, this is a question about this paper I read from somewhere. Uh, for for <laughs> yes, for for some for some features such as previous impressions. Yes. Why do you do square and uh, yeah. square root and uh, was that third square okay. root? And, and, and treat it as three features and put into the model. Sure. So the wording they use in the paper is, so they normalize all of these features. They normalize over um, quantiles. But they say that empirically, if they scale them differently, so just the normalized value, the square root, the square, uh, something else maybe, the model performs better. Their guess is um, these different scalings allow it to extract more nonlinear relationships in the features. But and other it's way more sensitive to them yeah. eventually, right? It, it, when, when you're using the different powers of square and you're normalizing them, it gets very sensitive to these information eventually, right? So the small difference will make a huge, like a small change between 25.1, for example, and 25.2, because you square rooted it, you used it as it is, and you squared it, these differences eventually add up to something. So that's, that's the reason why they did that. Okay. Um, a, a comment from online from Sohail, he's saying, I heard people talking about age and gender. Uh, I think his point is online, that's not very reliable. So that is why they use uh, geolocation. It's, it's actually what, it was one of our discussion points, but we thought it might um, get too choice in here. <laughs> so is it actually valuable to use gender in recommended systems? for videos, but not like, for example, if you're buying stuff, maybe, but for video watching, is it useful? I, I don't know. Some videos are very gender specific, I would say. Like, like okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. Channel war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe some, uh, yeah, some topics, you know, might be, I don't know. Um, the but even example, even no. even, even no. if they are gender specific, isn't yeah. even the the user profiling is gonna already capture that information? The user profile? Yeah. So we like what I mean by that. For example, um, actually no here. So we do a lot of other than the gender, right? Uh, we do a lot of user features. Isn't this might be captured from one of the features? Yeah, other, other than explicitly saying, oh, female and male or whatever? Yeah, I think that's the point. I think the, in the Victoria space, it's, it's going to be captured. Actually, one clear variable as it is. It's not just a part of a vector. It's a binary or whatever. 
make this hypothesis testing whether I incorporate it or not will make a like valuable way. Problem. This is a scientific way. Well, by so my understanding, with and yeah, without my understanding, so of course it would make a difference. Why if they say it won't make a difference? I'm like, no, I'm not saying it's not going to make a difference. <laughs> I'm saying, is it going to make it? Are you 100 percent sure it is going to make a difference? I'm positive yeah. on it. Okay, <laughs> you work at Google. <laughs> yeah. I want another question. Maybe you have talk, mentioned this. Uh, in the ranking model, why not use lo uh, classic uh, logistic regression, but, but instead weighted logistic regression? Did you mention that? Uh, so you mean for the, the training part, right? Yeah. I, th I, think, I think the main reason would be like to, to be able to modify after the AB, live A-B testing, right? Because okay. The point of it is to keep on changing it again and again. Like uh, he yeah. has a different answer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's because I'm just gonna say that. Okay. So oh, are you using that uh, using Chinese? That. Yes. Uh, web? Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So just to clarify, so it's weighted logistic regression. So you're weighting the probability that a user is going to watch a movie. You or keep on saying movie video. Um, you weight that by for every positive example. You weight that by the. Um, or how long the user did watch that video. And then from there, then at serving time, when you calculate these sort of odds, then you're able to get the expected amount of time someone's going to be watching that video. So it's because of their sort of optimization goal and the business choice that they've made. And the business choice is they want to model how long someone's going to watch a watch video. Um, that's why they use weighted logistic regression instead of just logistic regression. I think that's what. He says and next time, if you have that translated and sent it to the presenter. Does that mean like really short videos kind of get like shafted? They do, actually. Yeah. Um, it's every time they change the algorithm to fairly frequently. And if you pay attention on Reddit, there's a lot of vitriol every time something goes wrong. Because all of a sudden, the channel that makes 10 minute videos doesn't make money anymore. Yeah. So. <laughs> One of my favorite YouTube channels is Five Second Films. And all their videos are five seconds long. And well, maybe they fly. They probably have a Patreon. <laughs> Any other points, questions, anything? Okay, if there's no other questions or comments, let's thank Omar, let's thank Preston, let's thank Preston. <laughs>